Wason Choi's first novel, The Jade Peony, spent 26 weeks on the Globe and Mail's bestseller list and placed number six on its 1996 year-end national bestseller list for fiction. It shared the Trillium Award that year with Margaret Atwood and won the Vancouver Book Award. Welcome to the bibliophile, Wason Choi. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Your latest book is entitled All That Matters. Would you say it's about the immigrant experience? I would say it's about the immigrant experience when they decide to begin to ask the question, are we part of this country in this sense? You know, Are we going to be here? Are we going to go home? Uh, where do we belong? And it's time we ask, I think, all immigrants, and especially their children, begin to ask, what really matters to us since we're in between? We don't belong here and we don't belong there. Perhaps you could give us just a quick precy of the book, and then we could talk about mm -hmm. the wonderful grandmother. Well, it's a book about the family of uh, Chinatown pioneers in the 1920s and 30s and during the war years who began to understand that they were not wanted in Vancouver's Chinatown and not wanted in Canada. There was the Exclusion Act. Uh, but against all that, as the children grow up in this country, the Second World War comes, and there is a struggle about, well, who do we fight for? We're in Canada, but we're not citizens. They don't want us, really. In fact, some of them at that time tried to join and were given terrible jobs or simply laughed at. So what to do? So they felt some pull of patriotism and duty to the country, and they, and they were denied that. Yes, because, you see, when they went to the schools in Canada, they integrated with the Canadian system. And, of course, we're taught Canadian loyalty and British loyalty in particular. But then when they went home, they were in a kind of bubble of Chinese values and old China. And who are they? So I think it's a struggle that goes on today when people come from different countries and there's turmoil back home. Should you be here? Should you be there? But how would people eat if you didn't work here and sent money home? Then, of course, the conflicting values of one culture playing out against another. What languages should dominate? What happens when your children begin to lose their languages? And then most of all, the language of the heart, which at that time was, and even today I'm sure, a kind of trap for racism and bigotry and fears of the other. Like, what if your children married somebody different than if you fell in love? Should you or shouldn't you? Should you or shouldn't you with, with another race? Yes, with another race. So, you know, there was all kinds of battles going on in terms of cultural warfare that weren't spoken out loud, but were always there as a kind of quicksand of, of trying to discover who you are. So the book is about the first son born into this family who moves among the men of Chinatown and then discovers that he must make other choices that would go against tradition. And being a decent person, he tries to make the right ones. doesn't make headlines, of course. Decent people don't. But, you know, all of us have well, that well, point. Well, some decent people do. Well, some decent people do, and thank God they do. But in the ordinary sense of the, of the way most people live and how most countries are made strong, it's just people who do what, what will matter. Mm -hmm. It's a, the Tolstoy view of history where it's, it's just a whole series of, of small, small events, small, small deeds. choices, as you say, deeds, yeah, exactly. as opposed to this big man history, uh, the vision of history. I uh, use as a symbol for the cover of the book, uh, when I was asked you know, how I would like the book designed, I said, you know, the butterfly is very important as a symbol to this book because the stepmother comes in and she delivers a silver butterfly to the young boy mm -hmm. who will be her stepson. Now the young boy, of course, had hoped that it would be a little dragon. Yes, yes, and he didn't understand that significance. And I think of that butterfly phenomena, which the you know people in physics say that if a butterfly flaps its wings 2,000 miles away, it can influence the strength and direction of a tornado. On the I other side of the world. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's what happens because 2,000 days later or 20 years later, that single deed or that single example of what one should do can guide us from storms. And I think it matters. One of the things that struck me was 
there's a, a very strong will, and uh, obviously she's uh, she's crucial in in the young boy's formation. The grandmother who quite interestingly, holds her own prejudice toward the whites. Yeah. Yes, she, of course, represents the older generation who came knowing some of the cruelties of, you know, the, that colonial setup in China, where, in fact, the Chinese, especially the peasants, were treated very badly. We'll start that question again. <laughs> yeah, let's do that again. I've lost my thought. Yeah, so we were talking about the, the uh, grandmother. Yeah, the gr yeah the grandmother and the fact that she's holding a. I don't think prejudice is too strong a, a term. Not at all. She doesn't want her grandson hanging out with the white kids, mm -hmm. the, the Irishmen. Yes, and of course Toronto was an integration of ghettos. You know, the Irish ghetto, the uh, Vancouver. The yeah. yeah, Vancouver rather. Yeah. yeah. The uh, yeah, Italian ghetto and so on and so forth. In those days, in the twenties and thirties. And grandmother came from China, where, of course, she was aware of white people treating Chinese people very badly, because that was, of course, the imperial British colonial system. And when she came to Vancouver, she heard the stories of how the Chinese people were treated, uh, the earlier ones that came. So she, of course, through ignorance and through the lack of contact, held to those prejudices that the other was a fearful and despicable inferior group. Luckily, she had 5,000 years of Chinese history to back her up from her point of view. Well, and as you say, though, it's her, her experience told her that the, the white people, the uh, races, were dangerous and aggressive. And Yes, and if you look at the history of China with the, co the colonialists, that seems to be true. But in fact, she also was human. And as she lived next door to an Irish family, inescapably, eventually the mother of the young, b her, her stepson, her brother, her grandson's uh, best friend, becomes kind of friendly. They, they look at each other's gardens and they admire the vegetables and the flowers and they make exchanges and before you know it, something, a bridge is being built. And she doesn't even understand that in fact she kind of likes the neighbors. But she can't be too open about that, yet there are deeds that she will do and the things that they will do for each other that will matter. One of the things I love about the, the character, her character Popo, yes. is the fact that she's, she conveys this lovely ancient Chinese wisdom mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a very sort of a br abrupt, but, uh, but also with her storytelling. And uh, you can just feel the young grandson of, you know, absorbing it and respecting it. And yes, well, Kim of course, like myself growing up in Chinatown, had the blessing of the elders taking care of him and as I was. And they were storytellers. They came from villages where knowledge and wisdom was conveyed through stories. And of course, they took the stories of their own lives and told them in such a way that you learned the lessons of survival. Yeah, one of the things that, again, uh, that really came through in, in the book the, the, certainly the early part of the book was how beneficial it is for the young people to have this larger extended mm -hmm. family and, and then the community helping to raise them whereas in our society today you know there's so much pressure put on the nuclear family to do everything and, mm -hmm. and that's why it's exploding and, and uh, so that really came through the lovely uh, it takes a village kind of idea, right? Well, I'm glad I'm glad that's been noted. But there's something too that's that's interrupted this idea of a f extended family contributing to raising the child. Television has taken over, so that even where there are families who share, you know, different generations, the TV set is turned on and no one is talking. I was blessed with storytellers, people who thought that what they had to say was important for me to know. But television seems to have taken over that authority, and in a sense, a lot of families are being homogenized to the values that uh, the advertisers and you know the um, the owners of the media uh, would prefer. That's right. There's the surrogate parents and, and babysitters, aren't they? Yes, and that's why I think there's going to be some bitter disillusionment about the North American dream that we should all be the same, because in the end, we aren't. Mm -hmm. We're families with different 
sources and different roots, and we need to rediscover them. One of the things that came through with uh, with the, the grandmother was her superstition. She didn't want uh, the the young grandson. His his mother dies uh, young in an awful way. Mm-hmm. But the grandmother doesn't want to upset her ghost and her spirit. So she's the she's very concerned about doing the right thing. And I wonder if you could explore that. The yes, the elders of Chinatown when I was growing up worshipped in, in traditional fashion the idea that the ancestors would still be with you and directly those in, in your bloodline would even be in the same room at the same time during crises. So not surprisingly the grandmother felt that the first son's mother who died in China would have to be respected and uh, he would have to know that when the new mother came that she was not the mother, she would be the stepmother and it was so powerful a feeling that when the stepmother had her own children, her children were told to call her stepmother because the first wife did not want to be replaced, Mm -hmm. at least from the grandmother's point of view. And since she was a matriarchally powerful, the father obeyed this sense of nomenclature. I don't understand now why it was so strong, but when I did my research, I discovered one of the reasons was that uh, the Chinese people, families could have more than one wives and so on and so forth, and there's more than a hundred ways to refer to family members in their line and descendancy and so on and so forth, whether it's third ank or second, second concubine or whatever. And that was because it allowed everyone to know their place in the family, who will inherit what, so there was a hierarchy. There was not. They were not equals. No, they were not equals. They were also in hierarchy, which isn't particularly positive. Particularly not, but it avoided the chaos of who shall get what, and what should happen thereafter, because it was a very Confucian idea that the eldest and the sons, in particular, yeah. were to rule and to dominate and take on the responsibility, the moral responsibility, of treating everybody fairly. Of course that didn't always happen. So in a sense too there was a spiritual sense of obeying then the ghosts of those who died Mm -hmm. and those who had the most power when they were alive could still be very strong and influenced through their their ghosts as they they were called. And and respect for them obviously too. Respect and fear and love. Fear of reprisal. Yes. Yeah Yeah, it came through too again in our um, modern society catches in the throat the fact that the stepmother, first of all, the family that came over was the father, the son, and and the father's mother. So the three of them came over, and then later on, it was almost, it wasn't quite a mail-order bride, but you get that sense Mm -hmm. that, wait a minute, we're just basically, we're going to get someone over here. It's almost one of these um, marriage that's... uh, well, it's, it's an arranged marriage. Also, of course... But even he, she would never be his mother, though. It's like she's arra- it's arranged mm-hmm. for her to come over, yeah. but she's not. She's just sort she's of a like lower... A, like a helpmate That's who right. also would bear the children of the father. And how would that make her feel? Well, she, of course, was wise in her way. She had no power when she came. And I think what happens in the book is you gradually see, especially as the grandmother goes older, that she begins to gain her power, but very subtly, because there was a balance that she had to adhere to, and it wasn't her right to fight it. Although, as you know, in the book, she has huge dramatic moments with her, with the, with her husband about uh, why she is treated a certain way. But he seems uh, not so much helpless as in, you know, someone caught in respecting his own mother, and the matriarchal system in place because she was the elder, um, what could he do was the feeling, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. he loved them both. Yeah, isn't that interesting? It's a very, uh, you know... And common, I would imagine. I think in families where, you know, the grandparents are there, there sometimes must be conflicts, certainly. Mm -hmm. We know of the mother, the classic mother-in-law conflicts. Can you imagine the grandparents as well? So it's never that simple. And it was quite sad, too. I mean, uh, when the stepmother does have her first child, it's a girl. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a lovely, uh, what is it? Uh, 
first of all, they they don't go to the the great restaurant. They go to the sort of the regular restaurant yeah. to celebrate. <laughs> Well, you see, uh, the birth of a boy, of course, would have been a great joy. And in the tradition of Chinese uh, sensibilities towards uh, girls, uh, the birth of a girl would be a little joy. That's right. It's the little joy versus the... The great the joy. Great joy. And the great joy. Yes. Yeah, the and, I mean, born. and of course, in China, they, they, just, well, they just throw them in the ditch. And, and, and well, in those days, uh, yes, you know, that kind of... Um, sense of what was important was the sun. And, you know, there was only so much that you had to feed whoever would survive. So those decisions were made. Now and they're made throughout, the, uh, you know, the world even today. I was going to say, now... In what all kinds of cultures. Yeah, you know? what about here? Like, what about here in the Chinese community in mm -hmm. Canada today? Well, the blessing of being here is that there is enough food and enough shelter for all the children who would be born. But even then, I'm sure if they were traditionally uh, Chinese in any way, uh, boys would be preferred. But it's now less about the food; it's more about the opportunity to earn a living. And, and theoretically, yes, women I think it's changing. You know, certainly my generation of Chinese and, and very modern Chinese coming now are like Westerners. The children are really equal. But we are talking about anybody from the old school of thought and the hauntings of, uh, you know, people from India and uh, the Italian uh, village people who still would think that the boys were more important. It's not unusual that that's so, but it's sad. Yeah, I mean, uh, so the boys' self-esteem is automatically raised because uh, because they see, they experience all these the, the the thrill that the family has, whereas the poor poor girls they get the opposite. <laughs> well, I think part of it is too is that that thrill is not always long-lasting because <laughs> therein lies the responsibility. Yes, that's true. Uh, <laughs> to be better than all the rest, you know. Yeah. So yeah, that something they have to live up to. This. Yes, and that's some of the conflict that I deal with in this book. One of the things, again, that I thought was so interesting was the, the, the profound influence of the grandmother on the young, uh, the, the grandson, and yet, you know, she, she's constantly sort of putting him down and calling him sort of a no-brain yeah. grandson, and yet, <laughs> and yet you know that there's, she's not, she doesn't mean it. You know that she's, she's yes. full and of And he understands that, too, he, yeah. because it was a traditional way to, uh, you know, make sure that you're not overly proud of the grandson or the gods would strike. And so the son, the grandson too, is uh, is humbled. Yes, yeah. in that sense, yes. The, the grandmother and all her friends lavish praise on him for his, his intelligence yeah. and uh, his his manners, and they they all love the fact that he's tall. Now, is that something in Chinese? Uh, well, I think because it was a sign that then he would be warrior like, prince like. You see, that also was part of you know. So height is revered in the Chinese? It is in a certain respect, but it wasn't essential. But the brain and the, the intelligence would be certainly seen as more important. But in a new country where all the kids are taller, you know, and then your son is tall too, so therefore things must be going well, mm -hmm. I think it's just a natural way to think of tallness. Yes, yeah, kind of prosperity. And yes, uh, prosperity. And, but uh, at the same time, of course, everyone knows that being tall or short should not influence who you are, but it does mm -hmm. in every culture. It's, it's ironic, though. I mean, you know, some of the greatest leaders ever have been short because they're yes. battling against like Napoleon. And, and exactly. Trudeau was actually quite a short man, a small man. Yes, and all the, the movie stars in these adventure films, when you meet them, you're, you're looking down to speak at <laughs> you're them. You're like Tom Cruise is a little... Well, not a you know, midget, but, but they're achievers and they deserve what they, they've earned. But certainly all cultures have their illusion about what are the virtues. But I just want to read a little paragraph here. And again, again it gets the whole attitude of, of Chinese families when they have girls. In Ham Sui Fa? In Ham Sui Fa. Ham Sui Fa. Oh, yeah. Mrs. Lim told me hardly any girl babies were abandoned, though quite a few were sold to merchant families to be raised as servants, or were traded for a boy baby who would be a greater joy for the adopting family, or, if undesirable and ugly, would be given away like the children given away by white people. In this city, 
and in New Westminster and even Victoria, there were buildings that warehoused hundreds of such children. Was that the case? They were orphanages. Not uncommon because before birth control and then the heavy-handed treatment of bastard children, terrible word, by the religious institutions, uh, many children were abandoned because they were abandoned in shame. And so orphanages were very common at, in the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. And then we know th of the scandal of abuse in those orphanages throughout Canada. It's we, a history yeah. that we don't understand entirely, but it is the prejudice against the innocent that we make the innocent suffer. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, the, uh, the grandmother frequently, and you use the term, knuckled. Hmm. Knuckled. But, uh, yeah, you got knuckled on the head. <laughs> That's where the idea of the knuckle sandwich came in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the knuckling isn't quite as bad as the whipping. That, and again, she, the grandmother doesn't yeah. like to talk about how awful Her it past, was. Yeah. Uh, I'm writing a new book. Uh, there seems to be a demand to know more about the grandmother. So I'm writing about the history of Po Po before she came to Gold Mountain. How all her... Sorry, Gold Mountain would be the would district be within Vancouver? No, Gold Mountain was all of the West Coast because gold was found in California all the way up to the Fraser Valley. And of course it was a mountainous region, the Rockies. So uh, people in China referred to North America, the West Coast especially, as Gold Mountain. And Vancouver would also be included in that term. I love this little line, and, and, and you do spend a fair amount of time talking about the preparation of food. I chewed with even greater mouth-watering Charlie Chaplin intensity, desperate to catch the eye of someone starving to death. Charlie Chaplin intensity and the gold rush, and it's just such a beautiful mm -hmm. uh, word picture that you come up with there. Well, it reminded me that... Uh, you know, the Chinese were not isolated. They went to the movies. They saw the silent films. In fact, my English name, Sunny, is a name that was inspired by Al Jolson's song, you know, Climb Upon My Knee, etc., Sunny Boy. And so there was always integration going on. And no culture can remain pure. But purity was very important in those days. One of the things, again, the sense that we get from uh, reading your book is the... Uh, almost the rebuilding of family. The grandson comes, and then, then his stepmother comes, and then she has a daughter, and then they adopt another son. It's almost as if you're rebuilding a family in a new world. Yes, I think it's consistent with a lot of immigrant cultures that came over here, where they would realize that, you know, the sister-in-law back home could send their son over here as a paper son, to this family here to help the family, you know, grow and uh, do more work or whatever. So that wasn't uncommon. And what I like about that is that that meant that people had to then open up beyond themselves, beyond that idea of the nuclear family in, in extending their love and their shelter and their protection. Now, they also, of course, demanded that whoever would come would also do their share. So there was a real community that went beyond simply one family mm -hmm. and would include others. Something that I think still happens now, but certainly not openly. There's a, a theme that runs through the book about doing the right thing. As a result, you, you produce your luck. Mm. It's something that I was taught when I was very young, that the choices you make, if you make the good ones, that you add to your understanding of how to receive more good or how to access more goodness from life. It's not unusual to think of that because it seems to be very logical and in most cases it's lucky to be good because you attract what will work for other people as well will work for you. So there's a kind of logic to it. But there's also a mystical idea of luck that luck chooses those who are fortunate and that also was part of it mm -hmm. because we do know Lord knows that there are some people well rewarded who are totally undeserving <laughs> but for well, the rest the of us <laughs> is where they get it, 
Well, so we hope. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that because I might have to follow through That's on that right. myself. <laughs> so my book is about, you know, really all that matters. The title of the book suggests yeah. that, that it's very important uh, we understand that the things that don't make headlines, I mean, most of the important things in the world are, in fact, invisible. As San Exubre said, you know, the important things are invisible. Mm -hmm. And what my novel tries to, to discover is where is that invisibility in our action? How does it come to a, a kind of context where we can understand it? So when the first son is growing up and he has to make choices, there is a triangle love affair, of course. His Chinese girlfriend has an episode with his best friend, the Irish boy who lives next door. Yeah, she just wants to have a white guy, a boy. Yeah, yeah. And, and so she says, but in fact, that's probably her way of saying, but because I can't fall in love with him, even if I did, I can't admit it. He's different, but what would it be like? So I think... There was all kinds of tragedies involved with internalized racism, which this book is also about. That good people can internalize prejudices in such a way that they behave as if their behavior was natural and wasn't taught. Like, for example, I mean, this happens to women a lot. If you were a woman of that generation, you wouldn't think of being an engineer or a doctor or whatever. You might think of being a lawyer, but I mean, think of being a secretary, but mm. never a lawyer. Mm. So those are internalized oppressions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there is a complex of them in each of us. And to discover it often is a shock. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's a narrowing, but we don't see it because we assume that's natural. When I was growing up, I wouldn't think of becoming an actor, a dancer, a singer, a writer of songs, any of the arts, uh, because I was Chinese. Mm -hmm. Who would want to see me dance, sing, or if I wrote a book, what stories did I have to tell? Mm -hmm. Thank God when I was in my 50s and asked to write a book, I had matured enough to know, just a minute, my story is as important mm -hmm. as anyone's, and even more so because it hasn't been told. And I think if I tell it truthfully, then other people will say, I hope, well, that's my story too. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should tell mine. Yeah. And I think that maybe I should throw off this self-restricting. Uh, yeah, as if my past was not important. That's why many of us don't ask our own family members at some point, "Where do we come from?" Mm. But that's why many family members, like many of the Chinese of that time and the Jewish people, who went through the Holocaust, they don't want to talk about the past. Mm -hmm. It was too horrific. That's why they come to Canada to escape it. To escape it and to uh, then raise children who would not be burdened by it. But I think the fault is. Of course, don't burden the young as they're growing up. But at some point, they should know the history of survival mm -hmm. and what it takes to make choices that still allow you to remain decent people mm -hmm. in spite of all that terrible time, that terrible past. And I wanted to know how, from a, a, a period of injustice and racism and a terrible past, do people emerge as good people. Mm -hmm. That's basically my journey when I write. I'm still making those discoveries. And how do they? I think they do by discovering that what they crave and want as decent, healthy human beings, other human beings also want. And you build a bridge between your want and my want, and we discover we can get it together. You know, life is, I think, in a way, a banquet table. And if you only want to be purely Scotch or purely Chinese or purely Japanese or purely Italian, I mean, there's your banquet table. But, you know, I was born in Canada, and I had all the best of what Canada could offer, plus my Chinese uh, background. And my banquet table is so much larger. And why shouldn't we all in, in Canada especially understand that? And as children grow up here, why shouldn't we mature and understand they will have to make their own choices from that table, discover what nourishes them from that table, but respect what is still there that might nourish other people? I love the way you put it, because it, you know, and it's, and it's so evident in many of the cities across the country. You talk about the banquet table, and we, yes. we look, we're in Ottawa right now. 
15 years ago, 20 years ago, we didn't have anywhere near the choice of wonderful restaurants. Oh yes, and the food, that fusion, that, that improves yeah. each other's uh, contribution. And also, again, our children uh, now, this generation, right on their doorstep they can uh, go out and be girlfriend boyfriend with uh, all sorts of mm -hmm. different uh, people from different backgrounds it's so do you know uh, there's an odd phenomenon that some academics have noted that for a certain generation now you know third fourth fifth generation of people born here in places like Vancouver the idea of race doesn't cross their mind they have children who are children who it's have more exotic this. i mean t I, you know it's well, it's an enormous banquet table why yeah. would we ask for less and why would you, you as know. you say, why would you just go and take one <laughs> one serving of one plate off the table? Yes, yes. I mean, haggis, I don't think <laughs> that should be the only thing on the table. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, bless the haggis, but let's <laughs> let's let's realize that there's so You're much You're going to get sick more. on that, you get sick on it pretty quickly, wouldn't you? But not on the poetry of Burns, thank mm -hmm. God. You mentioned a few minutes ago feeling this restriction until you were 50. Can you tell me... How did it manifest itself in your life then? What what did you do till you were fifty? Mm -hmm. You know, like how did it? Well, it wasn't fifty, of course. It's a gradual process of understanding. When I, uh, as a teacher at Humber College, realized I was teaching more and more a multicultural classroom. But but th th let's get back to your mm -hmm. your Canadian experience when you were. Yes. Of course, I'm going to think that this is uh, this, to some extent autobiographical, and if it is the case, then you have a lovely, strong foundation of pride and self-esteem, I think, as a based... Mm -hmm. I think this young young man would have that. Yes. How were you restricted? How were these internal restrictions? How did they manifest themselves oh, well, in your life? In my day, it was... In my growing up, you have to think of the 1940s and 50s. The idea of purity was important, cultural purity. You were either Chinese or you were not, or you were in between. Sort of like the Quebec pure lane, you know? Oh, yes. And, you know... In-betweeners were not considered that good because you were neither this nor that. In other words, I became what they called a banana. I was yellow on the outside, but born with all the uh, white Anglo-Saxon British uh, education, the British literature, thank God, because I bless that for sure. But uh, I didn't think of world literature or Chinese literature. Mm -hmm. So I was yellow on the outside, Asian, but white on the inside. And uh, that used to be kind of shameful or not good enough. But now I realize, uh, I wrote an essay called I'm Proud to Be a Banana because I caught on just a minute. I actually have access to both worlds and I can be a bridge to both worlds. But how did it manifest itself in your life from, let's say, age 20 to 50? How um, were you restricted? I think it happened probably around age 10 and 11 when uh, we left Vancouver for Belleville, Ontario, where my father opened a fish and ship shop. And there I discovered that I was the outsider in a real way because there was o I was the only Chinese boy, for example, in the whole high school and schools that I went to there. So I discovered that I had to see people differently because they saw me so differently. And I was thrown off balance. And then I began to integrate in a real way by understanding that, no, there were people who also saw me as human after they got over this otherness in me of being Chinese. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, they didn't, I had friends who didn't think I was Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, well, first. Yeah. But how, did it restrict you? Like, did you, or did it motivate you to do particularly well in school, for example? Well, it motivated me to do well because my mother and father certainly said I had to do well because I was Chinese and I was the example and so on and so forth. And I'm glad I fell for that because it worked. It made me work a little harder and realize my difference. And then I always had the idea of Chinatown where everybody was Chinese. And here I was suddenly, I didn't consciously think I was representing anybody, but I did know that people would see me as one of many of the same. And I think that happens to any of us who are different or who are a minority in a majority culture. But after a while, you do integrate and you forget it. And the friends who are close to you forget that process and you just become one with them. I did know, of course, that this was not so when I hit adolescence and then there was a dating process. And the parents, even though my friends uh, would not treat me in this way, their parents would. Why would you go out with that boy? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, no, no, we don't want, etc., etc. So 
it's just one level after another that one struggles through. And then, bit by bit, you discover that other people have been struggling through it, and it made more sense to work with people than to fight them. And I think that's what happened to a lot of my generation. We integrated, we proved ourselves, and then finally we had the ability to be more open about our own lives, and people discovered, well, we had the same problems they had. Yeah. And then people intermarried, and my friends, you know, intermarried, and I went out with different people. So eventually, because there was prosperity in this country, and there wasn't a lack of employment, or, or you know, there was a fight of one class of people against another, or one race of people or another, we had days of heaven where we made the right choices. And this has been a foundation for me, and for my generation, and for the younger people. Sorry, days of heaven? Well, Days of Heaven are times when you sit there and everybody might be different, but you don't mind and you hardly notice. So do you have, have you run into prejudice uh, and, and racism and uh, has it affected the I've career choices? Too? I've actually run into something that is referred to as reverse prejudice because I was a minority, say, in Belvoir, Ontario, and people could be friendly to a few Chinese. I don't know what would happen if there was 30,000 Chinese for example, I remember uh, Dick Gregory saying, the black comedian saying in Vancouver at one point, well, I'm so happy uh, Canada doesn't have a race problem with its nine Negroes. And that was those days, you see. Mm. And he was right, okay. you know. Mm. So I have to accept that there is a time when there's a reverse prejudice. Now, then the latest movies have come out, and the young people now are worshipping the Hong Kong Kung Fu movies, and then now you see all kinds of kids, white, orange, yellow, whoever, putting on these outfits to be more Asian in their fighting abilities. So this integration is coming, and that's how it works. And then you go and eat some food, and somebody says, well, I've just tried this new recipe I found in a magazine, and it's got to do with Indian curry. And some people go, oh, I never like, well, okay, and then you try it, and suddenly you realize you're just eating food that you like. And something wonderful happens then. But only if this country, we as individuals in this country, can relax and realize the other is not a threat. Now, there's a fundamentalist streak also in many of the immigrants that are coming, and they represent to me a throwback to the 19th century and early 20th century immigrants who came having to protect themselves from the majority's fear of them. But there's less of that now. And those fears are simply the result of a lack of experience with other people and of ignorance of other people. But that's classically all prejudice. So my book is an attempt to say, well, here's how a family who had all that, how they grew and moved into a world and gave themselves a glimpse of heaven however hard it was. And I don't mean that the heaven was perfect, but that the heaven said, no, you can live in peace and be with each other in peace. Why would you choose anything else? Before we started the interview, we talked a bit about uh, Krishna Mehta. Uh, oh, Krishna, Krishnamurti. And his message of observing one's own mind in an effort to disengaged and mm -hmm. harmful aspects mm -hmm. of it. Can you, can you share yeah. with us, first of all, your philosophy of life, if you will, oh. uh, based, based on your appreciation of this, of this writer? And, and also, perhaps we could also touch on the fact that you've had some severe health problems. Mm -hmm. And what is it that you want to do with your writing, given the fact that you've come close to death? Well, as you know, in 2001, I had an asthma attack. They induced a coma, and I was in a coma for 11 days. And on that third day, I had a heart attack as well. So they pulled me out of it, and I was four months uh, recovering. And, of course, anybody who has had a near-death experience comes out of that, usually asking, why am I still here? What does it all mean? What does every day mean now that I've been given this day? And then, as you might know, that was 2001. Last year, 2005, I had another heart attack, and this time I was given a quadruple bypass. So I've gone through this kind of experience twice. And I guess I do have a philosophy about life, but I had it before, and I think it was this, that, you know, as a teacher, I discovered I could teach my students better if I taught them as I taught myself 
How does the brain work? What walls have been built inside the brain that prevents you from learning? And what fears are in there somehow from shame or humiliation? For example, students who were afraid of the word grammar, I would say, well, where did you get that fear from? Mm -hmm. And they were quite startled that I would teach a grammar lesson with that idea. They were afraid of grammar. They just thought it was stupid or dumb or boring. I said, no, no, it's not. But those are words you use mm -hmm. so you can deny that you're afraid of failing in afraid understanding. Of looking, looking silly. I mean, I think that's the biggest yes, barrier. Exactly. They don't want to make a mistake because they just don't want to look stupid. They don't yeah. want people thinking that they're stupid. And yet they are afraid because, you know, if you t taught them something else and they l wanted to learn it, that fear wasn't there. So it was still essentially the fear, not the only the fear of looking stupid, but the fear of something they thought they could not do, they could not achieve. Mm -hmm because they didn't have the self-esteem. Right, or they weren't taught appropriately. They were taught that it was, you know, something so simple that how could they not know it? And then nobody taught them. So in life, many of our fears and our lack of being able to do something often has to do with first to understand where that fear came from and what walls it built up that we assumed were natural. And therefore, we didn't want to think about it. And so we didn't. Or it was just an unconscious thing that was at work within us. Yes, absolutely. But it's not up unconscious as much as subconscious. We have access to understanding it. So I think very strongly, I began to understand that. Very important to me was the fact that I taught myself to learn things that I feared. And the things you feared were what? Well, th some of the things I feared were, for example, knowing more about my own health. I mean, why did I have these two collapses? Mm -hmm. Well, for one, I refused to listen to what I needed to do. And I thought, why did you do that? I was too busy. I didn't care to know about those dangers. I was not so much invincible as plainly stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, most human beings are stupid about what they should be careful about. Like, for example, if you like driving fast, why shouldn't you just drive fast? Uh, even though you know it's stupid to drive fast. But where did the stupidity come from? Mm -hmm. If you go further, why would you risk so much when you have so much to lose? And then you open up things that you have never understood before if you can dare to confront those steps of learning. So that's been my life. And when I write my books, I look at my characters and I say, what are they not understanding or refusing to see? What are the consequences? Mm -hmm. And what will happen if they stop and said, I know this is stupid, but why am I avoiding it? What is my fear about avoiding this stupidity? The message is so universal. If you face your fears and then you, you liberate yourself to be able to, to live a what? A more self-actualized... Uh, well, I don't know about those terms, but I do know you confront the mortality. And why do you exist at all? Mm. And I think everybody probably finds their own answer. I exist because I'm actually excited by life by the possibility of art, of writing, of dance, of song, you of you people making contact. You exist to to share the lessons that you've mm -hmm. lived through as a, as a Chinese-Canadian. Well, I actually think it's more selfish than that because I discovered this wonderful thing that seems to be very human. If you open up and share something that's intimate, you strengthen who you are and you strengthen your relationship with another person. So there's less loneliness in your life. Mm -hmm. And there's more reason to move on, even though it's one more day that you've been given, or one more moment. And I can't imagine one wouldn't want to live like that, once you discover that. That you're not just living by yourself or alone. When you reach out or build a bridge instead of a wall, yeah. it makes an actual difference against depression, against being stupid about your own health, against being careless. Because it's a bit like with the, the speeding. It's like, well, what do you speed for? You speed to escape boredom because you're afraid of you say loneliness but the, the, this fear of yeah that there's not void. enough there's not enough excitement in your life so physical excitement like dangerous sports or dangerous uh, behavior seems to be the way to get it but in fact it's the way of the devil you're not getting anything you're going to just need more and more of it yeah. like a, a drug you know yeah. so you need to rediscover what is exciting about living and paying attention to a moment, to who you are and who you are when you're with someone, and not to miss out. I used to tell my students in my class that um, there are angels in this classroom, but we have to pay attention because we don't know who that angel would be. At a given time, it may be you, it may be me, it may be someone else, but 
it like does the muse, happen. The, 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 the message the muse, coming through. Yeah, the muse, the excitement, the sudden inspiration, or the uh, sudden joy, as some of my students discover, the grammar can be fun. Mm -hmm. They think that's so shocking. Well, I never knew that exercise could be fun. <laughs> and lately I've been, as you know, doing rehab four times a week, and I'm turned the corner and I'm going, I've been missing this. I'm 67 years old. What an idiot. You got why the, didn't you got the I runner's high then, or what? I did. <laughs> you know, I said, why didn't I know this? Why didn't I learn this? Why did I avoid it? Because I thought I didn't have to bother, because I was too busy, because I didn't think I needed to balance the, the body with the mind and the spirit. Well, then I paid the consequences. But you know, I'm lucky. The gods were kind. I've been given two warnings, and I'm still here. What a joy to be here. Absolutely. Well, what a joy it's been to have you here. Thank you. That's really great. Thank you very much. Wayson Choi is the author of All That Matters, which won the Trillion Book Award? Yes, it was nominated for the Giller. I lost to Alice Munro, but I won the Trillium, and she was nominated for that. I would have loved to have won it with her, believe me. And if she won it, that would have been just as a great a pleasure. And also Jane Jacob, of course. Who's just left us. Yes. 